Welcome, you guys. Good to see you. Uh, people are coming back from vacations, starting to fill back up for the fall. Definitely a lot going on. Thank you, Pastor Graydon, for doing that. Um, could not have been a better soft pitch for the sermon in Acts 13 today. Uh, I'll give you the big idea, and then I'll give you a little reason why. Here's where I'm going to argue from today. Mission Church must be part of the outward gospel movement. Mission Church must be a part of the outward gospel movement. Now, we're glad you're here. Those of you that are watching online, we're glad you're here. Um, Edinburgh, Texas, we see you. We love you. We're glad you're here. We love that you're here. We love people. Everybody loves a good party, amen? Okay, so we, we like to party here. We really do. But the church, by definition, church with a big C, it's never about just getting here and staying here and closing the door. It's about getting here and recognizing the fact that we've been bought with a price. We're not our own. And so we get here and we change, we assimilate, we grow, we hold one another accountable. We do discipleship groups. And then for the church to grow, it must grow outward. So we're a planting church. So we're looking right now uh, in the west part of San Antonio. We're looking in Bernie. We're looking in Spring Branch. We're looking in places that there are not churches. We want to send people. We want to send people. The church, by definition, if it does not send people, missionaries, evangelists, we're going to talk about them today. If it does not plant churches, it's not the church. It's just not. Okay, that's what it is, all right? So here's, I'll, 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 I'll give a little platform for that. There's always in transition pain and issue. I remember uh, back in the day when I played sports, first two weeks of pads and shorts or first two weeks of wrestling or baseball, whatever, it, it, usually there's some throw up involved because a lot of us were not in shape or we'd gotten out of shape and now you got to get back into shape and that's what you do. Transition when you go to college. Can you remember some of y'all back in the day when you went to college, that was a big deal. You went from being a big fish now to a small fish, all right? Remember going from being single, some of you, to being married. You really thought you knew what you were doing, amen? You did not. Okay, remember from going from just you and your wife, or your spouse, you figured it out finally, and now you have a child. Oh my goodness, you thought you knew what you're doing. Again, now you do not. There's hardship in transition. There's suffering in transition. School's starting back right now. There's new rhythms. There's new jobs that some of us have. This is when the enemy attacks in transition. Now, all of missions, if you... If you think about it, all missions are transition. Why, why are all missions transition? Because you're going from a comfortable place and you're sharing with somebody that does not know Jesus. You're sharing about Jesus. What are you asking them to do? To consider change. What is change? Transition. So missionaries are involved in transition constantly. Evangelists are involved in transition constantly. So I would submit to you today, church, that we, as the body of Christ, church with a big C, whether you're a part of mission or another church, that's fine. Church with a big C. We must be about the outward gospel movement. We, we must be for that. When we see it, we must high five it. We must join our, you know, we must join to that wagon and go forward. We're not here to be still we're not here to be alone. We're here to go forward. Uh, Acts 13, 34, we'll start. It's the third part of Paul's sermon that he's giving to these people. It's, it's kind of sneaky where he goes today. I'll break it down. Let me pray. We'll get right into the study because I got a lot to accomplish in 30 minutes. Um, Lord, speak as only you can. Thank you for the people that are here. Uh, some of us are in transition right now. Some of us have just started school, new jobs, new relationships. Uh, some of us have just come to Christ, and we don't know how to talk about you yet, but we want to. Some of us have not talked about you in a long time, Lord, and we need to. So open our eyes that we might see, that we might understand that if we're going to follow you, we're going to have to be like you, Lord. We're going to have to talk like you. We're going to have to love like you. We're going to have to forgive like you. In your name we pray, King Jesus. Amen. 
Paul continues on in his sermon, and this is where he begins. He begins to be called Paul and not Saul. As to his raising him from the dead, he's talking to the Jews, the legalists, the church people of the day. He's talking to them about, about Jesus. As to his God raising him from the dead, never to return to decay, he is spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Now, David was a hero of the day. David was like one of their poster guys for everything awesome. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay. Who's he talking about? Jesus. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, died, was buried with his fathers and decayed. That's a rough word, but that's what it is. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you uh, these Jews, he's come into their, their synagogue telling them, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Here he's coming kind of in the back door and he's talking about Messiah without saying Messiah because that was a huge buzzword. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. There he said it. He's saying, he's saying your law is not enough. And the Messiah that you and I have been talking about and wanting to know, we met him. We've seen him. He's the man, Jesus. So first part of the sermon today, Paul's last part of his sermon uh, from verses 34 to 41, if you're looking. Um, now, some of these, I'm just going to give you some of the truths of this passage. Uh, and you, if you are a man or woman in pr transition, in, in choosing and deciding to speak up and speak out and be heard about your relationship with Christ. All these should just make you happy. And if you're not, if you're just that person that may need to even ask the question whether you're saved or not, or is it time for you to wake up and stop being so safe and start being a little dangerous, these things should get you fired up. Here's the first one, verse 34. Jesus never dies. David did. That's good news, all right? It's not good news that David died. David died like we all die. You're gonna die, I'm gonna die. Uh, we, have, we have an end point. Jesus, who died on the cross voluntarily, what did he do after three days? Came back from the dead. Why? Because he's the creator. And you don't take the creator's life. Paul is saying to these religious people, listen, the one that you idolized, David, he decayed. He was awesome. He was super cool. Yeah, yeah. He died. He's done. He was a king. He's, he's, he's in heaven right now. Jesus, the one I'm talking to you about, by the way, he's a Messiah. He never, he's, he's not going to die. His body doesn't decay. Now, here's the truth of the matter. Luther died. Anybody a fan of Martin Luther? Anybody like Martin Luther? You can raise your hand and say, yeah, it's not a bad thing to like Martin Luther. I thought he was pretty awesome. He was married to a nun. How many of you can say that? I also am married to a nun, Pastor Tom. Yeah, maybe, probably not. Luther was. Luther died, okay? Calvin died. Some of y'all know who he is too. Um, R.C. Sproul, who I had the pleasure of meeting, my father who was his seminary professor. He died. I've got news for you. John MacArthur is also going to die. John Piper one day will go on to heaven. All the people that we know and we look up to and we, and we think are awesome and great, and they are. They're going to die. Jesus never dies. Jesus also goes further than that. Jesus forgives sin. Anybody need sin forgiven? All right. You can also raise your hands on that. Those that didn't raise their hand will pray specifically for you today. Okay. Yeah, we're freaking sinners. We're dirty. We come to the throne dirty. And Jesus is the only one that can say to you and me, I forgive you. Now, you can forgive somebody that offends you. I get you on that. But you can't forgive them of doing that to you. You can say, I forgive you. I won't hold that against you. Jesus can forgive the sin and he can go a step further. Jesus, verse 39, justifies sinners. The law does not. So Paul was quietly, and Paul is a black belt in evangelism, right? He really does. He, he snakes this in and lets the people know, hey, Jesus is Messiah. 
Jesus is going to come in, has come in, will come in, will stay here and cover all the law things that you think make you good. The capacity you have to not say a bad word or to keep your hair short or vote conservative or vote whatever your thing is. Like all those things are legalistic. They won't save you. Jesus has the power to justify you. And what that means is, is in your brokenness, in my brokenness, the horrible things we've done, this king can look at you and me and say, I choose to make you whole before my father. And how I will choose to make you whole is through my blood shed on the cross. My voluntary effort of dying for you that you might live. Jesus is the only one to do that. So by default, verse 41, Jesus is Yeshua. Jesus is Messiah. And like Pastor Graydon says, we worship him. He's the one we're about. Verse 40. Paul goes on and says this. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. That's a, that's a sharp segue. He's been nice. He's been soft pitching them. He's been telling them the gospel, telling them about Jesus. And now he says, so because of these things, because of who Jesus is, and you need to know it, beware that what happens to the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe even if someone were to explain it to you. That's from Habakkuk 1.5, who was a minor prophet. When Habakkuk was, was saying that, he was speaking about what God does and he was saying even in Old Testament days, like, listen, when God does a work, it's amazing. Amen. How many of y'all are like, yeah, yeah, that's my story. Like, I, how, If I could just take like a snapshot of some of y'all right now and send it to your people of like 10 years ago. And I would say in that, this is your boy, this is your girl in church today worshiping. How many would your friends be like, that's not where they are. They could not be there. How many of y'all are surprised that you're in church today? Listen, I'm your preaching guy. I'm surprised I'm here today. Okay, I had no desire to be in the church at all. I had seen my father be a pastor. That was enough for me to check out of that position forever. And yet the first year and a half in my marriage, it was falling apart. I knew we were going to get a divorce. I knew we were broken. I knew there was something, some issue there. I began to read the Bible, I think, honestly, for the first time at 31, 32 years old. And the grace of God knocked me down and I was never the same. And I became a Christian sometime in that span, like six months later. I, didn't, I don't have a prayer of salvation I prayed. I was saved by the grace of God. And I literally just woke up one day and realized, oh, my goodness, I think I'm a Christian now. I love Jesus and I want to be about him. Listen, how many of you are surprised that you're here? God does amazing things. How many friends do you have and family members do you have that you want the Lord to save right now? I've had a family member that I prayed for for 24 years and I'm watching that person walk into a relationship with Jesus right now that is so awesome. And I just praise the Lord for it because it's nothing I did. I taught that person how to party. Now, God is teaching them how to praise, okay? And I get to witness that. Verse 42, as they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. The people did. Who do you think those people were? After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. There's some thought there about what they were arguing with them. It could have gone either way. But the people, it says the people there asked them to come back. Verse 44, the following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. So here's the question before we get into that detail right there. What did Paul and Barnabas spend a week doing? I mean, right? So they Sabbath, which is Saturday for them. Uh, will you come back next week and speak? Yeah, I'll come back next week and speak, which means they had seven days. What did they do for seven days? Go to the beach? I mean, what did they do? They, they went 
and discipled. They had time. They had conversations. They probably went to dinner parties. They sat down with people in groups of twos or threes and they talked about what they were saying. They did not leave. They stayed. I always encourage evangelists I know. Hey, you may be a drop the mic speaker, but why don't you learn how to stay a few days after you do that and talk and share and be. So next week, everybody came. Second part of the sermon, Paul and Barnabas asked to speak again. The people were intrigued, verse 42 and 43. Why were they intrigued? They were interested. They were, they were captivated. Why? Why were they intrigued? Christian, go back and remember the first time that something about the grace of God or the gospel of God or Jesus himself or some piece of history or a word study you did just blew you away. Remember, what, what, what was that? What was the power there? It was truth. It was reality. God was revealing himself to you through a conversation, through something you read. You ever been reading scripture and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, look at this. Does anybody else see this? This is amazing. God had used Paul and Barnabas just to tell the truth, not to be compromised in any way, just to tell the truth to the detriment potentially of their lives. The whole town came out to hear them speak. Verse 44, everybody came out, which means that people that were hungry for the truth came and people that were interested in not so much the truth, but the regulation of the people that were there. You always have them, right? In our, in our life parameter, it's called government, okay? They want to regulate. They're there too. So here's what happens. Paul and Barnabas are there. They see these people that are hungry Gentiles. They have never heard, don't understand the law, and are now hearing about Jesus for the first time. And they see the Jews, the legalistic people, the churchy people, the people that have always been there and are bound by tradition, not truth. They're all there. So what happens next? The gospel is presented to the Jews, the church people. They rejected it. Now the gospel will, will be presented to the Gentiles, outsiders. How many of us know people that were raised in church that if you ask them to sit down and have a conversation with you right now about a book in the Bible, they probably would not want to do it. I'm not saying all church people do that. Okay, I think the church is filled also, the invisible church, it, with the real body of Christ. But I think legalistic people who have learned enough to believe that they have controlled the medium, if you were to ask them, hey, you want to go to lunch today and talk about, uh, I don't know, First John? Be like, nah, I mean, I'm kind of good. I'm all right, but you know, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. I could take you to Greece right now. We could go walk around the streets of Athens and I could introduce you to some, some, some boy prostitutes that are 14, 15 years old that don't want to be prostitutes, but they're going to be because it's how they're going to live. And, and they are willing to talk to you about the gospel of God. They're willing to talk to you about Jesus. You know why? Because they are hungry for truth. They're dying for it. I can introduce you to other people in other parts of Athens that are trapped, that haven't seen their family in four or five years, that are doctors and lawyers, that cannot go anywhere and they're living on the street. They'll talk to you about the gospel. Why? Because they're hungry and they're in need. They're in need. Most people in the United States aren't in need. That's the problem. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas boldly replied. Now, Think about this. It's like a crowd like we have in our main today. A ton of people there that are interested in hearing truth and a ton of people there that don't care about the truth. They're just ready to fight. They're just ready to fight. And here's what Paul and Barnabas say. Boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. So church people, we've come here today to, to talk to you about the gospel first. It was necessary that we do that. And now that we've done that, basically, since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, those would be fighting words right there. We are turning to the Gentiles. So those of you that are part of the church, we've told you now the truth. You know the truth. You think you don't need it. The people that are sitting to the left and the right of you that are really hungry, we're going to talk to them now, not you. I mean, if Paul wanted to keep from a fight happening, that was not what he should have said. That's all I'm saying. 
Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we're turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. And this is from Isaiah. I'm going to read you uh, the real verse there in just a second. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now here's the real passage, which is just ridiculous. And may this be... Maybe may this be like uh, a war cry for a lot of you this year or this season in your new job, your new school, your new relationship, your new place, maybe for your family. God says through Isaiah, who is a complete loser by earthly standards, nothing he ever did really went anywhere. His ROI was horrible. Here am I, Lord, send me. God sent him and he failed over and over again because nobody listened to him, all right? Yeah, we listen to him. Why? Because he was obedient. Okay, he's obedient. And obedience matters more in failure than the, than the act of failing or succeeding. God says this, I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose. Now, this is, this is your calling, church. So this is God speaking to you and me today. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose. And I will hold you by your hand I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. This is powerful. This is like, this is like fighting language right here. This is saying, God is saying to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, listen, I've called you out. For a righteous purpose. The first thing God says is he will do what? I will hold your hand. Uh, my family's here today, so I'll try not to look at them so I won't tear up. I have three girls, okay? They're older now. They're not little kids. The youngest is 12. I still hold their hands when I go places with them. And, and I will ask them, hey, hold my hand, not because you need to, just because I want to. And uh, I was walking in with Emma my middle daughter just the other day to Target or wherever we were going. And we got out of the car and I just put my hand out and she grabbed it. And I remember in my heart thinking, yes, yes. Why? Because I'm keeping her from being hit by traffic. No, she's fully capable of not being hit by cars at 16. She can do that and she knows where the entrance is, all those things. She is my daughter and I love her with my whole heart, like I love my other daughters and my wife. And it is just a pleasure to be close to her. And if anybody messes with her, they will be hurt first by me and then when my wife finds them, okay? <laughs> so it's just an honor. It's a pleasure. And God is saying to me and you in this process of this transition... For some of you are already out there. Some of you have been comfortable. You're fat and lazy. Let's get up and do something. It's time to go to the battlefield. God is like, I got you. Here's my hand. I'll walk with you. Okay? What's the next thing he says? He's watching over us. That gives me a lot of security because I know how Selena and I watch over our kids. <laughs> A lot of y'all are coming out of the vacation season. A lot of, there's a ton of little kids at mission and vacation. When you have little kids, vacation is not vacation. Amen. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Okay. You just count kids the whole time, no matter how many you have. And if you're with friends, then it's been multiplied. And so if there's seven little kids. You're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, I'm having a good time. You having a good time? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, 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 seven. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Fine. Let's go. It's time to go back to the beach house. We're having a good time. Okay, it's not, but they do get older. And after a while, vacations do become fun. I promise you, God is watching over us. He's watching you. He's watching you. He, he's, he's prepared to see a lot of you have incredible gospel-driven conversations this fall. And he's also prepared to allow some of us, just to, statistically by numbers, to die. He's okay with some of us being martyred. He is. This is what the church does. This is what the church does. It's been safe for a while, which means it's kind of the name church is getting rubbed off. I want the church to be in bold letters. I do want people to be able to say when they see us, oh, you're a part of the church. I'd like to hear that more often because it means that we're doing something right. Because by default, then we'll also hear are you, part, are you part of a church? You ever had anybody say that to you? 
When you're a part of a body, hey, are you, uh, uh, do you go to church? Because we've been looking for, we've been looking for a church to go to. Um, that's what the church needs to be. For our kids, this, we, we just hired Abram, why? So we can have a cool youth group? No, so kids can meet Jesus. Because when kids meet Jesus, then future families are changed, all right? Sometimes adults are changed as their kids come to Christ. We want to be a part of that. We have mission work happening in this city. Why do we do that? Because people need to meet Jesus. This is, this is the thing that we focus on all the time. What's the next thing after he's watching over us? His covenant will be in us. Like not only the covenant will bless you, but it will be in you. And so you have this powerful covenant that cannot be broken that has now been imputed into you as you become the missionary and evangel you've been called to be. Which covenant is that? It's the new covenant. Who, who made the new covenant? Three distinct entities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're not liars. They always tell the truth. So the covenant is strong in you. So the truth that we have that we carry, the words that we can say, what are they going to do? They're going to be a light that shines in us. Listen, do you, have, do you have somebody in your history that it was that person, a man or a woman, that just every time you were around them, you just knew they loved the Lord in a way that was just like, golly. My lady's name is Vera, a little Italian lady from North Carolina. She's about this tall. And when I was not walking with the Lord, just smoking weed and partying and raising cane, and I looked like a redheaded Eddie Vedder. It was not a pretty sight. Like I had a long, ugly ponytail. I would come to these dinners in our neighborhood, and Vera, this little Pentecostal lady, would be like, oh, Tom, good to see you. And she would want to put her hands on me. And when she put her hands on me, I would cry. And I don't want to cry in front of anybody. And I was like, Vera, stop touching me. She's like, oh, come here. When are you going to cut your hair? You look so good with shorter hair, son. <laughs> and she would talk to me about Jesus. She would do it with a smile on her face. And I would just see her coming and I could just smell Jesus in her. And I could feel it and I could see it. And when she was dying on her, her deathbed one day, I had come to Christ and I was able to talk to her and say, hey, Vera, it's Tom. It's Tommy. Like, I, I just want you to know I love Jesus now. Thanks for praying for me. I will see you again one day. You are called to be a light. Are you a light right now? Are you just somebody that knows the light? That's a problem. It's a problem, church. We are comfortable. We, are, we know the verses. We know the history. We know tradition. So did the Jews in this conversation. They knew tradition but they did not, were not filled with the light. And the last thing we are able to do is we will witness blind people seeing and those in the dark coming into light. You want to see, you want to see some of your friends and family come to Christ this year? Get off your spiritual butt. And tell the truth. Get grounded. Get back in the game, y'all. Join a discipleship group. Be held accountable. Join a community group. Know other Christians. Don't just do it for your own little fun. Do it because you're getting equipped. Think about it. If you go to the gym, do you want to go to the gym just to talk to people or do you want to go to the gym to get fit? Some people do just want to go to the gym to talk to people. That's true. Some of us want to go. You know, in January, it's the worst time to be a part of any gym because that's when everybody gets, feels guilty and buys a gym membership and they come for about a week. And I always look around like, when are y'all going to leave? So there's room for those of us that actually want to work out. Do you want to work out right now? Do you want to really exercise spiritual muscles? So this fall, you can have conversations with people. And some of your conversations with us will start like this. PT, you're never going to believe it, but here's the conversation that happened this past week. Johnny and I have those conversations. Great and I have those conversations. Like, hey, you're not going to like, listen. I don't know. Well, I know what happened now because it's happened a number of times. I, got, I, met a, I met a Russian kid last week at the gym. His name is Tamir. I'm going to have coffee with him. I had to talk with him about Jesus because he's like in perfect shape. So to keep me from getting bitter, I decided to you know, love him in the name of Christ instead. <laughs> and uh, he speaks like four or five languages. And he's, he's been in the country for several years. He's got his college degree. And he sees the United States as completely different than most of us see it. Why? 
because he's from Russia, okay? He's come from very hard times, and he gets here, and he's like, there's so many opportunities. And so many Americans here say, give me more, give me more, give me more. I don't want the church to be like that. I want us to be the ones who are like, let's get ready. There's conversations to be had this week about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only one that can forgive. And Jesus is the only one that can justify. And Jesus is the only one that can seal a man or woman's heart and they never be the same. And their families change and their children's change. A lot of y'all are here. You're curse breakers. That's what you are. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, now remember he's speaking to the Jews and he's speaking to the Gentiles. They're all in the same area. The whole town had come out. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Who's the word of the Lord spread by? Not the church at that time. It was the new church. It was those that were being sanctified. But the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Third part of the sermon, we'll call it a day after this. The gospel spreads. When the gospel spreads, dissension increases. So Christian... If you're a Christian, you can listen to me for a minute. If you're a real Christian, as you speak in the name of the one that saved you, dissension will increase. Not decrease. You're not going to have more favor. You're going to have favor with those God has called. You're going to have less favor with those that are against Almighty God. Verse 48, Gentiles, the Gentiles, find joy and glorify the gospel of God. Now, rejoice is the word chiro right there. Um, it means to be well, to thrive. So when you rejoice, it means you're well. It is well with my soul. Peace like a river. It is well with my soul. You think about the person that wrote that song. It, things weren't well outside, but they had decided to be well with God. This is where rejoicing comes from. And they began to thrive. And because of that, they did what? Doxa means to magnify or to hold in honor. That's what glorifying means. You cannot magnify and hold in honor God when you are not finding joy with where you are. You can't you can't say I'm bitter and angry and I will not forgive and how dare that person, but I just want to glorify God for a minute. Those don't, those don't work. We must find joy in where we are and what we're experiencing. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And I just glorify you, God. And I don't know what to do next, but I glorify you. I don't know how to respond right now, but I glorify you, Lord. I glorify you are the Lord. You are the Lord. Second point, all who had been appointed believe, verse 48. Appointed means tasso. Uh, whether you're reformed or not, that's what it says right there, to put in a certain order. It literally, the word tasso literally means to addict. And so some of, y'all, some of us have been addicted to all kinds of things. The Holy Spirit is like, let me addict you to the right thing. Let me make you completely dependent on me. Let me make you completely needy of me. Let me justify you, open your eyes that you may see, and then continue to sanctify you that you may need me every day. That's what addiction is. The message spreads through whom? The believers, the church, the new church. It wasn't the church that had been there. Jewish troublemakers incited the prominent men and women of the community. Paul and Barnabas leave to Iconium about 100 miles away. And in verse 52, it says the disciples were filled with joy. What disciples? The new ones. The new ones. Paul and Barnabas are still doing the missionary thing. And there's new believers in that city that are now sharing with others who Jesus is. I'll finish with this. Mission Church, again, we must be a part of the outward gospel movement. We're going to be saying that a lot. This is, we want this to be your church home. But we need you to know that that this church home sends. 
We send people, okay? We send people. This is what we're called to do. Christians, I'll speak to you first. Discipleship is a must. You have to. You have to be in discipleship. Well, Pastor Tom, I'll pray about it. You can stop praying about it. It's biblical. You got to do it. So come, come be a part of discipleship this fall. If you don't want to do that, go to another church, but be a part of their discipleship there. Okay, be a part of discipleship. Have people speak truth into you. Be accountable, grow, be able to speak. Christians, community is where we assimilate and prep to go. All right, be a part of community groups this fall. If it's just for 30, 45 minutes, come make a sandwich, say hello to somebody. I know you're dead tired. A lot of us are in community group time. Okay, and then leave, but connect with the body. Christians, outward care of non-believers is what we must all share. We need to all have evangelism stories. Well, I'm not an evangelist, Pastor Tom. Well, you, last time I if you're a Christian, you are. You may not be the best at it. You may need some of us that are gifted in that area to come with you, happy to do that. There's plenty of men and women here that love to talk to people about Jesus. We'll teach you how to do it. And there's not a way to learn. It's when you get filled with the truth, you share. That's how it works. Non-Christians, I'll finish with you guys today because you're here. Who is discipling you and how is that working for you? Everybody's being discipled. Maybe you're being discipled to act a certain way or to live a certain lifestyle or to have a certain attitude, have a certain mindset. Does that discipleship model have eternal significance and value to you? If it does, I mean, cool, then praise God for you. But if you're, maybe it's time to be honest. If it doesn't, we, we have something that does. What does your community stand for, non-believers? What's it really about? Ask the hard questions, okay? Um, and if you want to, join us in being cared for and caring for others. There's power in caring for others. Our whole country right now is addicted to narcissism. It's it's the, it's, it's the heaviest fire that's being fueled everywhere we go. It's online. It's in person. It's your own personal pronouns. It's you. It's you, 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 you. It's what the Bible is focused on, on others, 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 others. The type of community that's healthy and that grows is filled with people that focus on serving and caring for others and laying down their life for others. That is our calling church. That's who we're called to be today. May the Lord speak to you. May the Holy Spirit ruffle your feathers. <laughs> and, uh, and may we just get fired up over the fact that Jesus is present. He did not decay. He is alive. He is ready to impute to you powerful things just for his glory. And then your greater good. Amen? Amen. Lord, uh, thanks for your word. It doesn't return void. Thanks for the power. Lord, thanks for the covenant you have said you will put within us. Thank you for the sin you forgive, the righteousness you give us, the relationships you allow us. Lord, thank you for the people that you're going to put in front of all of us, all of us this next week. And, and, and Holy Spirit, you may ask us to speak, to say something. In the name of Jesus, empower us to do so as only you can. May we do that for your glory. We know, Lord, as we stand up for you and as we speak out for you, dissension will multiply. Dissension happens in transition. And so, Father, may we just accept that. May we find joy like the early church did. Just, hey, this is tough. This is hard. But we will find joy in Jesus being in this moment. And therefore, in the toughest of times, we can give you glory, almighty God. In your name we pray, amen. Church, stand up.